Hello once again, my friends, fellow modelers, fellow Star Trek fans, fellow historians, fellow book lovers, and fellow lovers of everything interesting. Um, I got a little book to show you. Pretty historic book. It's kind of like a window into the past. Um, before I begin, I want to give a shout out to my friend Alan, who brought this book to my attention. Um, he did a review on it over on his channel, uh, Commodore Urban. And um, I just I just fell in love with the book. I had to have it. And this is such an awesome little book. It's like a window into the past. This is The Ships of the U.S. Merchant Marine by S. Kip Farrington, Jr. And the illustrations are by Jack Coggings. And you can see the gorgeous illustrations that this guy does. And we have a special introduction by Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. And if that name sounds familiar, he was the fleet admiral. And he's actually got a USS Nimitz aircraft carrier named after him. And it's actually part of the Nimitz class now, which is a huge, formidable war machine. So why don't we take this over to the desk where there's more room, there's more light. And um, I'll go through the book with you. Okay, there's a little bit more light. You guys can see the, um, it, it's seen its better days. Certainly, the jacket is really worn out. Um, it's ripped on the back. Um, I'm take the jacket off and the book itself, it's not in the best shape, but it could be in worse shape. respectable and you see that beautiful illustration and the spine Farring Farrington and Dutton ships of the merchant marine and there's nothing on the back now when you open up the book on the inside there's a map and you can see the essential US foreign trade routes served by American steamship lines you can actually see all the Pacific, the Atlantic, South Pacific, um, quite a f real big trade where you see even towards Alaska, um, Japan, China, down to Australia, South America, and the back one actually has a uh, pretty interesting illustration as well. You can see the inboard profile of a C2 cargo ship, the most popular class in service today. Now keep in mind, this book is from 1947. And I'm sure in her day, she was a great cargo ship. But you guys know what they have today would just dwarf this. The, the, um, the, the mask lines, um, the new I did a document uh, history of uh, one of the ships for you. Uh, they just they're huge. They are gigantic, and that's not to take nothing away from this lady. You can see the number one hold, the number two hold. Um, we got the cargo decks. You can see the hatches, and you can see the booms for all the cargo, the ventilators. So there's quite a bit of. Um, there's quite a bit going on, so you can imagine what they have now. All right, let's get put the jacket back on because there's actually uh, some things to read on the jacket. I just want to make sure that it gets back on. And again, I wanted to show you the inside of the covers, the front cover and the back cover. Okay, so... You look at the front, you open it up, and they give you some information. A book for young and old, for all prospective ocean travelers and cruise enthusiasts. Ships of the Merchant Marines by S. Kip Farrington Jr., author of Pacific Game Fishing, Railroading from the Rear, and Railroads at War, and The Ducks Came Back, etc., with an introduction by Admiral Nimitz. Illustration by Jack Coggins with two, 22 full color paintings many black and white drawings. 
and you guys can see the book sold for three dollars and 75 cents and for 1947 that would probably be a pretty good uh, sum of money the romance of seafaring and the call of fairway exotic places are embodied in this timely fascinating and beautiful volume of the post-war ships of all our new merchant marine and the companies that operate them painted especially for this book by the noted marine artist jack coggins are 22 magnificent full-color oil paintings of merchant marine vessels representing the foremost types of american merchant vessels each ship is portrayed against a different foreign background depicting one of the ports it touches on its route informative and non-technical the text consists of 21 short sections each concerning a shipping line headed by the illustration of one of its ships Writing in a pleasantly varied style, the author describes the design and luxurious accommodations embodied in our modern American vessels, with their many important innovations to ensure the finest, most efficient passenger and cargo service. The war records of many lines are described in the details of peacetime uh, reconversion, a uh, reconversion. The ship which appears in the illustration and other ships of the company are described with emphasis on their appeal to the traveler and special facilities that they have efficiently carrying cargoes to all descriptions. Usually before, there follows a brief history of the company, its war service, its place it occupies in the shipping world, the nations and ports which it ship itself. Black and white illustrations throughout the book show many more types of American vessels. There are also stack markings and house flags of each company in color, a great aid to the layman in identifying a ship. The end papers are a map of trade routes sailed by the merchant marine and a profile plan of a ship, which will prove helpful to the young and old. Admiral Nimitz says in his introduction, there is a natural tendency to forget the vital relationship that the merchant marine bears to our individual and collective warfare and peace as well as war. And my sincere wish that Mr. Farrington's informative and interesting story will serve to focus the attention of all Americans on a subject which is perilous to neglect and a matter of pride to remember. It is continued on the back. <clears throat> and you can see about the author. Since 1937, S. Kip Farrington Jr. has been saltwater editor for Field and Stream. A saltwater fisherman, he holds six world records. He wrote Pacific Game Fishing and other books on fishing and has contributed articles to many magazines, including Collier's Field and Streams, Cosmopolitan, Rotarian, Yachting, Reader's Digest, McLean's, etc. He is a leading authority on American railroads and has written a number of books on the subject, including Railroads at War, Railroads from the Rear End, that would be interesting reads, he has been decorated by the government of Chile for his writing about the country in 1945. He was sent to the South Pacific of the U.S. Army to show his fishing and shooting motion pictures to military personnel. That's pretty cool. He was a member of the committee that designed the emergency fishing equipment adopted by the U.S. Armed Forces. Mr. Farrington has sailed thousands of miles on American ships to ports throughout the world, watching their operation taking his place with engine room and bridge watches, making the entire transit through the Panama Canal and into important harbors as well, wheelhouses and actively participating in the loading and unloading of the cargo. Always intently interested on a merchant marine, he has observed the industry close up and his saltwater fishing activities all over, all over the world have also given him the opportunity for a first-hand knowledge of these merchant ships. His home is in East Hampton, New York. Again, this is 1947. If I can find a recent picture of this gentleman, I'll put it up to show you guys. And about the artist, Jack Coggins is a nationally known illustrator of marine subjects. His oils and watercolors have been shown in leading galleries throughout the country. And he has done a great deal of painting for American steamship lines. Before entering the Army, Mr. Coggins' technical knowledge of the ships and planes enabled him to execute many war drawings for life in other magazines, training posters for the government, and to illustrate fighting ships of the U.S. Navy. I always think of that um, 
the recruitment poster of the cartoon of Uncle Sam where he's pointing and says, Uncle Sam wants you. While overseas, as a soldier correspondent with Yank, he carried out assignments in many branches of the American and British armies and navies. D-Day found him assigned to the Liberty ship of the, US, of the U.S. Merchant Marine, where he saw and sketched the Merchant Navy under battle conditions at the beaches. Mr. Coggins now lives in New York City. And this is E.P. Dutton and Company, 300 4th Avenue, New York, 10, New York. Ships of the U.S. Merchant, Merchant Marines. And if I can find a picture of this gentleman as well, I'll put him up. Okay, so that's the information on the book. So why don't we show you guys the inside. You can see some of the other works that Mr. S. Kip Farrington Jr. has worked in. You can see an illustration on the bottom of a buoy. Okay. Ships of the Merchant Marine by S. Kip Farrington Jr. with an introductory an un introduction, excuse me, by Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, United States Navy. Illustrations by Jack Coggins. And this is the first printing, 1947, E.P. Dutton and Company Incorporated, all rights reserved. And let's see, what is the first beautiful painting? This is the Matson Lines SS Mariposa at anchor during a call at Pago Pago, Samoa. She's beautiful. And you can see another illustration of an old sailing vessel. And this is the introduction by Chester Nimitz, Fleet Admiral, United States Navy Chief of Naval Operations. He goes on to say, from the start of our offensive movement in the Pacific in the summer of 1942 to the surrender of Japan three years later, the never-ending plea of our armed forces was for the beans, bullets, and avgas, so essentials to fulfill the success of their missions. The thin trickle of those supplies which would be furnished in answer to the first anguished appeals to of our embattled Marines on Guadalcanal grew in volume and adequacy as the war progressed, in direct proportion to the increasing size and capability of our merchant marines. Not one of us who fought in later, uh, late war can forget, nor should any citizen be allowed to forget the national resource which enabled us to carry the war to the enemy and fight in his territory and not our own was our merchant marine. The fighting fleets and Marines of our Navy, the ground forces and our Army, and the Air Force of uh, an aircraft of both, which would have been helpless to pound the enemy into defeat overseas had it not been for the steady stream of personnel, equipment, and supplies of every character brought into the rear of the combat area, and often directly into those areas by the ships of our own merchant Marines and those of our allies. Twice in our history, we have prevented a possible invasion of our shores by the ability and capability of our armed forces to wage offensive and containing actions against the enemy overseas. While we cannot discuss the changes in which every new war brings or fail to appreciate the tremendous influence which air transport may have in the future, we must not lose sight of the fact that for our overseas military movement, we are now and will be for the foreseeable future largely dependent upon our shipping resources. It is well to remember that a professional army and navy are merely nuclei of armed forces needed to wage war. All the encompassing deadlines of other conflict and suddenness which it might be initiated make it imperative that no vital national assets such as shipping be allowed to atrophy during times of peace. To do so is merely an invite, a reception of the impotent situation with respect to shipping in which we found ourselves between two world wars. Since ships cannot pass by our front doors or come under the same public observation as a train, truck, or motor car, which daily impress themselves upon our consciousness, 
there is a natural tendency to forget the vital relationship with the merchant marine bears to our individual and collective welfare in peace as well as in war. It is my sincere wish that Mr. Farrington's informative and interesting story of the ships of our merchant marine will serve to focus the attention of all Americans on a subject which is perilous to neglect and matter of pride to remember. We're in Washington, D.C., and this was titled, uh, dated June 25th of 1947. You can see the illustration. There is a forward by S. Kip Farrington himself. No nation has remained a leader among free peoples which did not maintain a strong position on the seas. For trade, travel, defense, the American Merchant Marine. There is no more important model for every American citizen to know and to practice. The use of American flag ships by all Americans for trade and travel will guarantee an American merchant marine immediately available for national defense in any emergency. We all have a stake in the merchant marine. Our merchant ships are vital for the defense, indispensable to peacetime commerce. The United States cannot get along without the merchant marine. It helps provide employment for millions of Americans at the same time. It is an important part of our national defense. Without the profits from export and import trade, thousands of businesses would not exist. We welcome a certain amount of foreign shipping. It promotes peaceful commerce between nations. But let's not depend upon foreign ships, as if we do, those nations withdraw their ships as they have done twice in a generation. Our goods will pile up, waiting for ships that might never return and our seamen will again be turned away from the sea for the lack of jobs. The American Merchant Marine carried 270 million tons of cargo and billions of gallons of gasoline with oil, 4,000 tons every hour, day, and night during the war years. America's merchant ships carried 10, um, 10 million men to war and home again, our merchant marines turned overnight from a wartime operation to a life-saving organization on a worldwide scale. We brought corn from our farms to the hungry peoples of the world. The merchant marine rushed farm animals from our western ranges to restock the ruined farms of Europe and many other lands. We hauled coal from our mines and oil from our refineries to keep millions from freezing to death. Ships. We have got some good ships in our merchant marine but we need more new passenger ships. Men to sail ships, they are the highest paid and have the best living conditions of any seaman in the world. We must face the future squarely. Our ships need American cargoes and passengers to keep them in operation. We should have learned by now that our American merchant marine, which served us so valiantly in war and is so vital in peace is worth fighting for. Let's keep it sailing across every sea. The nation that invented the steamship must now use it. I am hopeful that all Americans of all ages, particularly those living inland, will get a better idea of the merchant marine from Jack Coggins' pictures. He is one of the best marine illustrators I know, and his part in his preparation of this book has been much the harder one. East Hampton, New York, July 31st of 1947. S. Kip Farrington, Jr. Okay, so now we actually go into the ships. We got the shipping company. Now, this is the SS America. You can see the United States lines and the flag. And I don't know a lot about this ship. I am very fond of her sister, the SS United States. Um, I'm thinking maybe I'll do a history on this ship and I'll do some research of the SS America. The country's largest ship Outward Bound meets a, a Morin Tug in New York Harbor, city's upper bay. And of course, this is 1947. Um, and I do believe the SS United States was actually larger than the SS America. But again, that's a beautiful illustration as she leaves New York. And then it goes on to give a little bit of information on each of the uh, shipping companies. 
It is pleasant to know that Americans can now travel to Europe on some of the finest and fastest, most luxurious ships afloat, ships that are sailing under their own flag. And when we are contemplating a cruise in southern waters, all of us should keep the thought in mind that we are the two American ships are giving perfect service. West Point, the largest naval vessel transportation service, and carried more American troops than any other transport in regard to those gigantic twins, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. During the war, years of West Point set a record for sustained operations, strict adherence to high pressure schedules and minimum harbor time to record unsurpassed by any other ship. The 26,454 ton West Point, originally named the America, was built for the United States lines in 1940 by the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. She was designed and constructed with an eye to the future. Her navigation bridge, her lounges, and her passenger and officer quarters epitomized the luxury possible in a modern liner. So I'm gonna have to do some research on the SS America. That would make a nice project video. And again, it goes into some more of the um, the ship. Her commercial life was a short duration. Um, for June fifteenth, nineteen forty-one, the Navy commissioned her in the U.S. Her the Navy commissioned her, excuse me, the USS West Point in early November of nineteen forty-one, when she was sent to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And it shows the information on what the ship did. What I did is I went through and I made notes to actually share some points of emphasis with you guys because um, I don't want this video to be 12 hours long, but there's so much here, so much valuable information. And again, it's, it's really important to keep this tradition going or that you at least know about the Merchant Marine. Looking at the next beautiful illustration, this is the SS Brazil. One of the more McCormick's three good neighbor ships passing famous Sugarloaf Mountain, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. You can see the more McCormick lines. And beautiful, beautiful illustration. The more McCormick lines entered upon its post-war operation with a fleet of 33 cargo and passenger liners. Newly constructed or redesigned and equipped with facilities to answer the most exciting demands of shippers and travelers. Look at some more illustrations. During the war from Pearl Harbor to VJ Day, more McCormick lines operated more than 150 ships, of which 11 were lost. Transported 754,239 troops and carried 34,410,111 tons of war cargo. The three good neighbor, the three good neighbor ships alone carried more than 450,000 troops and saw action in the Pacific and Atlantic and the Mediterranean where they took part in the invasion of North Africa. And you can see the heavy weather national bulk carrier, the Phoenix, of the world's largest tanker class battles in North Atlantic gale. And again, 1947, I'm sure she was a, a grand vessel, really big, but you know what they have now, the oil tankers, I just... It's like the size of a state. They're just huge. The tanker illustrated the SS Phoenix is one of the largest in the world, along with its three sister ships, the SS Nashbulk, SS Amtank, and the SS Hampton Roads. It makes up a quartlet of the largest tankers afloat. Each of these giant vessels displaces 24,000 tons and can carry 225,000 barrels of oil at a speed of 17 knots. The Amtank is giving credit in most quarters of having carried the all-time record load of oil ever carried. And again, that was 1947. I'm sure it's totally different now. You can see a tug. A 
Another tanker with a T3 of which about 60 have been built is similar to the T2, except that its length and capacity are slightly less. Many persons do not realize that tankers are equipped with large heating coils to maintain a constant temperature. Asphalt shipped up from the Caribbean must be carried at a temperature between 200 and 275 degrees to prevent it from solidifying. Tar and creosote are other cargoes that must be kept at high temperatures during the voyage. Molasses is also shipped by tanker, and to facilitate its discharge, it is heated a day or two before the vessel approaches port. Wow, I did not know that either. Okay, so now we're going over to the... This is the SS Lurline. Off Diamond Head, SS Lurline, one of the mat the Madsen Line, arriving at Honolulu from San Francisco. Again, look at that. She's beautiful. I like the smokestacks with the blue and the yellow and the Matson Line flag. On the morning of December 7, 1941, the Lure Line was homeward bound from Honolulu on her regular run. News of the Japanese attack was handed to the captain by the wireless operator at 10.15 ship's time. The Lure Line was immediately diverted from her course. Her speed increased to full ahead and her crew instructed to secure her for water tightness below and for the necessary blackout. Naval and military officers aboard gathered together and formed a staff to enforce wartime safety measures. At 1700, the passengers were called to the ship's lounge and the captain briefly explained the nature of the emergency, requested the cooperation of all in maintaining the blackout. So can you imagine being aboard that ship and hearing the news of the attack on Pearl Harbor? You can see some of the materials. Um, other materials on ship were ordered in enormous quantities, 4,500 metal doors, 35,000 gallons of paint, 150,000 feet of copper tubing, my goodness, 3,500 tons of hard to get steel and 984 telephones. So they had to be converted The decks, the engine room, plants, the three liners have undergone a thorough overhaul. Thousands of new blades have been hand fitted to 18 turbines, which in all power all three ships. I like her color scheme as well. This is the American South African Lines African Crest. Uh, African Crescent, excuse me getting underway beneath the shadow of Cape Town's Table Mountain. You can see the American South African line. You can see their flag and that beautiful ship. Cape Town, I think that's the southern part of Africa, but I'm not sure. The American South African line, the oldest American flag operator to South and East Africa, was formally established in 1925. But because the history of the business is always the history of the men who lay its foundations and carry it on, the story of this pioneer line actually begins nearly a century ago when Captain John G. Farrell came to this country from Ireland and settled in Fairhaven, Connecticut. The shipmaster of the old country, Captain Farrell soon acquired the brig Monte Crisco, which in 1863 became the first vessel under the American flag owned by the Farrell uh, family. That's pretty cool. Interesting little nuggets. Typical of all six new C3 ships, the African Star has an overhaul length of 100, 492 feet, excuse me, molded beam of 69 and a half feet, and registers over 12,000 deadweight tons, designed for speed of 17 knots. Bail measurement of space available for cargo is 620,000 cubic feet, not including the measurement of refrigerator boxes. Radar is standard equipment on vessels of the company's fleet, and ship to shore telephones are now being installed. The African Star was the first commercial cargo vessel equipped with radar. Well, that's good to know. And there's another illustration right there.
There is no more fascinating story of trade development for any area of the world than is revealed by studying the statistics of the trade between this country and South and East Africa since 1921. In 1921, our exports to that area amounted just over 169,000 weight tons of cargo. In 1946, exports exceeded 863,000 weight tons, a slight decrease from the wartime peak in 1941 of 1,058,000 tons. Oh, this is a beautiful picture. <clears throat> Look at that. The Varega, the Varega, or the Varagua. I want. I don't want to mispronounce it. The Varagua, Varagua. United Fruit Line laying at anchor in harbor of Teller, Honduras. Oh, that's a beautiful color ship. I love that. And look at the flag of the United Fruit Company lines. Since the turn of the century, the snowy vessels of the United Fruit Company's Great White Fleet have been plying the Caribbean. For nearly 50 years, travelers, teachers, ambassadors, and men and women of international good will have trod their decks. Countless tons of machinery and manufactured goods have been transported to our southern neighbors and to the capacious holds of this great armada have carried millions of bunches of bananas to the markets of the world. So they have different shipping lanes, different parts of the world for different, um, different items. You can see another. That looks like a, a light ship over falls. The other nine vessels are twin screw, ships capable of 18 knots, of 455 feet, 5 inches in length, and are 12,890 tons. These also carry 12 passengers each. You can see another sailing vessel. The great white fleet of today proudly it sails from very domestic ports to its friendly waters in middle, middle America. These ships are seagoing ambassadors of goodwill, destined to play a role of ever-increasing importance in the vital pageant of trade between the Americas. Oh, looks like we got another. Look at that. Again, looks like a cargo ship. The Alas in Alaskan waters, the Palisana of the Alaska Transportation Company, leaving Sitka. Beautiful painting. I like her color schemes. And you can see the Alaska Transportation Company. The Alaska Transportation Company operation is primarily a freighter service with facilities for handling all types of cargo with customarily moves to the Alaskan trade. Weekly sales are maintained from Seattle to the principal ports of southeastern Alaska, where connections are made with the interior of Alaska and the Yukon Territory. A vital link to the route between southeastern Alaska and the interior is unfortunately not open to traffic at the present time, having been closed by the British Columbia. Negotiations are now underway between our State Department and the Dominion of Canada, uh, Canada seeking reopening. And again, that was in 1947. And you can see another beautiful illustration of the ship. It looks like a lifeboat on a davit. There is a real need here for passenger vessels, which under present day construction costs require some form of government subsidy. But still another problem confronts the transportation to Alaska, that the labor management relations, which must be stabilized before ultimately dependability can be assured to the Alaskan seaways and so to the development of the vast resources of the territory. Another beautiful cargo ship. The Grace Lines Santa Cecilia, off the Chilean coast, south of Tacapillo, headed for Valparaiso.
and you can see the grace lines. And scarcely a year has passed after VJ Day when the Grace Lines reestablished full scale passenger and cargo service over its traditional route between the U.S. Atlantic ports and those of the Canal Zone at west coast of South America. Weekly sailings are now maintained by six modern combination ships, supplemented by the four nightly express freighter service. The new ship's a modified version of Maritime Commission's famous C2 design carry 52 passengers and over 8,000 deadweight tons of cargo. And again, it goes on about the C, the C2 SRAJ4 type of vessel. The cargo capacity is 494,556 cubic feet, including 91,795 cubic feet of refrigerated space. There are deep tanks for 2,149 barrels of liquid cargo. And I like that. It looks like a river boat, a paddle, paddle boat. Thus, the service of the great C2 freight ships is important and international relationships, both in their trade facilities and their luxurious passenger accommodations. This is nice. The SS Extavia, American export lines, heads toward the Mediterranean past the Rock of Gibraltar. Look at that. The American export lines. American Export Lines, one of the principal American flag steamship companies, operates essential trade routes between our North Atlantic ports and the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Black Sea, the Red Sea, India, Ceylon, and Burma. Application has been made to the Maritime Commission to extend these routes to Singapore and the Dutch East Indies. The SS Extavia is one of four, 14 sister ships known as the exporter type. Vessels of this special design are 473 feet in length, 60 feet, 66 feet molded breadth, and draw 27 feet, 9 and 9 sixteenths inches of water when fully loaded. They are registered at 9,900 dead white tons. Their speed is 16 and a half knots with a range of 15,000 nautical miles. can see another beautiful illustration the export vessels among company vessels lost during the war with a famous four acts popular for a decade in the New York Mediterranean passenger service former Excalibur and Exeter were torpedoed at the start of the North African campaign uh, the ex Cambion went down at Guadalcanal and again, you can see that paddle river boat. In the unsung but essential task of keeping an endless chain of cargo moving to the battlefronts, American export lines has to rec record have to be proud of. Handling one manner of another, 4,833 wartime voyages. Typical cargo carried by this steamship line even a generalist will indicate the merchant marine contributes to American living standards. Rugs from the Near East to North Africa, etched silver and brass vases, smoking stands, pictures from the same area, olive oil, olives, olive roots used to soap manufacture, tomato, pressings that ultimately flavor spaghetti sauce, wines, brandies, liquors from other countries. The company maintains special facilities aboard ship and its terminals for handling such commodities. Pumice for toothpaste, industrial uses, marble, silk, rayon, pottery, objects of art, native handicraft, and countless description of figs, dates, hides, bristles, and paintbrushes. Very scarce during war years. Tea, tobacco, dye stuffs, botanical and drugs of countless varieties, chrome and other ores, snails from Casablanca, Black Sea Caviar, Sardines, Diamonds, Rubies, and other precious stones, Jewelry, 
vegetable oils, sausage casings, furs, including stable and leopard animals, spices, talc, red oxide, rubber, almonds, cashew, hazel, pistachio, nuts, hemp products, precious metals, cork by the deck load, and countless other items, including mail. So my goodness, that's a lot. We would certainly take that for granted. All those items. Nice, beautiful illustration. It's either the sunrise or the sunset. This is the American President Lines, the President Polk clears the Golden State, the Golden Gate, excuse me. And the American President Line. Because of its always popular round the world service, the house flag of the American President Lines had become a familiar sight in many foreign ports prior to the outbreak of war. Now two virtually new passenger liners, the graceful and commodious President Monroe and President Polk, built in 1941 and carrying full passenger loads and much valuable cargo to the far corners of the globe. Beautiful ship. Let's see another illustration. Designed by Maritime Commission's Technical Division as designs PS, S1, DN1, and the V2000 were a type of design George Schott, noted naval architect. The new vessels will have practically double the passenger accommodations of the Polk and Monroe, 189 passengers as compared to 98. In addition, they will provide 532,000 cubic feet of cargo space compared to 476,500 cubic feet of cargo space in the C3 P-type vessels. In addition to express package cargo handling by the large passenger liners and the abundant reefer space they provide, the company's freighter fleet is equipped to carry most perishable commodities and especially design refrigerated compartments where whatever the outside temperature cargo such as easily spoilable agricultural products are kept in temperature best suited for their preservation. Ample deep, takes, deep tank space is provided for bulk liquid cargoes. Special lockers and speci, uh, speci tanks assure safe stowage for valuable and particularly fragile freight. The President Polk began her maiden voyage on December 7th, 1941, but it was halted by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. On August 21st, 1946, she sailed again from San Francisco after four years of war duty. Let me see another illustration. Look at that. Beautiful. Kind of looks like the United States. Oh, it is. You can tell the United States lines with those beautiful red, white, and blue smokestacks. A school of porpoises escort the Washington of the United States lines on an eastward voyage. So they're probably chasing the ship on porpoise. <laughs> okay. You can see again the United States lines. Beautiful, beautiful ships. The Washington and her sister ship, the Manhattan, were the largest and the fastest American luxury liners in service between 1933 and the outbreak of the war, and enjoyed enormous, enormously popular uh, with the travelers of all nations. They ran roughly in the North Atlantic service on the regular United States lines route between New York with the English-French channel ports of Hamburg and Hamburg, excuse me, completing easily in service the cuisine with the largest foreign ships. They were particularly noted for the excellence of the food served, just as the America is today. In fact, many gourmets consider it better than any other foreign ship. Other American flag lines have also cons uh, received this complaint, uh, excuse me, compliment, particularly since the war. And again, these were the largest. You got to keep in mind that this book was published in 1947. Let's see another, looks like a cargo ship, the buoy. 
She carried 120,000 passengers in the time period she was active, 600,000 tons of cargo. You can see a tugboat illustration. The United States Lines also operate one of the finest fleets of cargo vessels headed by 40 ships of the crack C2 type. These ships are easily recognized by the names they bear. American banker, American farmer, American importer, American leader, American merchant, American shipper, and American traveler, to mention only a few. Others are called the Pioneer Cove, the Pioneer Star, and so on, as they sail across the Atlantic to and from the United Kingdom ports to the continent, they carry diverse cargoes, everything from citrus fruits, tobacco, automobiles, to whiskey, fur, and bed feathers. Another lovely looking lady. This is Trial Run, the new Alosha Cavalier en route to New Orleans meets a shrimper in the Mississippi. And this is the Alcoa lines. Very nice ship. Three new sister ships, the Alcoa Cavalier, the Alcova Clipper, and the Alcoa Corsair are leaders in the type of passenger cargo ship which um, promotes which promises to be a major post-war trend in the maritime field. Each one of the ships have berth for 95 passengers. Passengers carry capacity were held at that figure in order to provide comfortable and spacious accommodations. All staterooms are large outside rooms, each with private baths. Again, I love the steamship air conditioning plays a big part in making the passengers comfortable regardless of the weather all passenger staterooms and public rooms are air conditioned with a single exception of the main hull which is open to two sides to sea breeze crew quarters are also air conditioned you see another illustration of the liner While the delivery of bauxite has been to Alcoa Steamship Company's chief preoccupation, it has by no means been its only role. The general freight trade originally con uh, conceived as a fill-in to supplement the bauxite service is daily becoming more important. I'm not familiar with um, bauxite. I don't know what that is. Look at the colors on her. The new President Cleveland at anchor in Hong Kong rotated uh, roadstead on her maiden voyage to the Orient. And you can see the American President line. As the shipping industry, like the railroads, miss labor disputes, shortage bottlenecks and other delay actions slowly emerge from war to peacetime operation. There had been much speculation on the part of the traveling public as to just what type passenger vessels will be available in America's new post-merchant marine. Post-war, that is. It talks about the accommodations, combining the latest design and passenger accommodations with the most modern machinery and equipment obtainable. These two 29,000, 22,900-ton luxury liners each carry 552 passengers in first, tourist, and third class. There's a crew of 338. In addition, 5,000 tons of general refrigerator and bulk liquid cargoes. The ships are up to 610 feet in length and have a beam of 75 feet. They have 20,000 horsepower turboelectric motors that propel them at a maximum speed of 21 knots. You can see another illustration. Other vessels in service to the Orient include six C3 type freighters, 
16 knot cargo ship, which in addition to the most modern car, uh, cargo carrying facilities, have comfortable stateroom accommodations for a maximum of 12 passengers. These ships are the President Grant, President Jefferson, President Madison, President McKinley, President Pierce, and the President Taft. In addition, numerous cargo ships chartered from the government are being operated by the American President Lines in their Trans-Pacific service. And look at this lovely lady. The SS Monterey in the harbor of Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. And this is the Matson line. You can see their flag. The Matson line offers superlative service and cuisine for the Pacific Traveler aboard its three magnificent ships, the Lura Line, Mariposa, and Monterey and it provides similar accommodations assured at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which it owns in Honolulu. A million dollars has been spent in redecorating the hotel after, it, after its use as a rehabilitation center for naval personnel during the war. Another illustration. That looks like an ore freighter, like you'd see on the Great Lakes. The C-3 service from Pacific Northwest to Hawaii is augmented by three Liberty ships, which make frequent sailings from that area with lumber, sulfates, and other cargoes. You see another illustration. Captain Elias R. Johansson, who joined Madsen, in 1920 as a shipmaster and who had the command of the Monterey since 1934 and is still her old man. Received accommodation from Commander and Destroyer Squadron 16 and was later awarded the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Medal for its marvelous rescue operation, which lives up to the high traditions of the Matson Line and of the American Merchant Marine. You can see, looks like another light ship off in a distance to San Francisco. And this is Pope and Talbert's P and T Seafarer with deck load of lumber passes San Francisco light ship. And this is the Pope and Talbert um, flag line. You can see their flag and logo. Pope and Talbot Incorporated, always on the alert for service to commerce and industry in developing new markets. Just as young Pope and Talbot reasoned out the needs of California in 1849, have in their present day operations helped open the way for important trade from West Coast to the islands of the Caribbean and the Caribbean Sea and to the Atlantic coast of North and South America. Looks like a car ferry. <laughs> the PT Seafarer is a big ship. The steel hull of the ship is 492 feet long, more than once and a half as long as an average city block. She has a beam of 69 feet. From the uppermost deck to the bottom of the hull, the distance is greater than the height of a three-story building. As it sets sail under Great Golden Gate Bridge, which spans San Francisco Bay, the SS P&T Seafarer is carrying on a tradition of American venture in the same way that the original Pope and Talbert Brig Oriental did a hundred years ago. It's a pretty ship. One of AGWI's new ships entering beautiful Havana Harbor, past historic Morro Castle. Incidentally, the Morro Castle was actually the inspiration for the Ward Line that uh, made the Morro Castle cruise ship, which went from New York City, her birth uh, dock, down to Havana. But that's a different video. I have done videos on the Morro Castle. 
but this is the Atlantic Gulf and West Indies line. And that is a pretty ship. The oldest American shipping concern and Cuba mail line owes its origin to the far-seeing Yankee ship owner, James Otis Ward of Roxbury, Massachusetts. You can see another nice illustration. By the end of the war, officials of the Cuba line realized that Havana, transformed into a clean, healthy city, was destined to become a popular winter resort for a mecca of tourists. Their belief was amply justified by 1907, increasing numbers of our tourists had begun to discover Havana. To handle the tremendous expansion of, in business, the company was reformed, reorganized, and reincorporated under the laws of the state of Maine. In order to resume their regular services to Cuba and Mexico, the Atlantic Gulf and West Indies steamship lines were now converting three maritime commission ships into passenger cargo liners. These new liners would be 459 feet long with a beam of 63 feet and have a speed of 16 to 17 knots. Another pretty ship. This is the Eastern Steamship Company's Arcadia. Passes a, da a dragger in the channel near Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Seagulls are a nice touch. And this is the Eastern Steamship Lines. Eastern Steamship Lines is a direct successor of several of the oldest steamship companies in Northeastern United States. Lines which operated between the ports from Hampton Roads, Virginia, to St. John, New Brunswick, and Yarmouth, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. Eastern also operated for many years prior to the Second World War. Vacation cruises and seasonal services to Bermuda, Nassau, the West Indies, and South America. The Arcadia returned from war service in 1947. She has a length of overall 402 feet, weighing 6,185 tons with a speed of 18 knots. The company, like many other shipping companies in America, is faced with serious problems and replacement of its fleet. Ships built during the war are not suitable for conversion or reuse in Eastern's coatwise service. Costs of construction and new ships for operation and unsubsidized American flag services have gone to such heights that a fixed charges on the necessary investment would probably be unbearable under foreseeable shipping conditions. Direct costs of vessel operations, particularly wages of crews and maintenance and repair costs, are now at such levels, and there have been practically no restoration of domestic services in private steamship operations. And under present cost levels and conditions of competition with land, land transportation, there cannot be a restoration of domestic services on any such extensive basis that existed prior to the war. Notwithstanding these favorable, unfavorable conditions, Eastern has maintained its organization and conserved all funds received from settlements for vessels lost or requisitioned by the government. It is in a strong position to take advantage of any favorable development, either in its former fields of operation or elsewhere. We've got a nice backdrop right there of a nice ship. The McCormick Lines. This is the SS Mormick Gulf. Cruises along the snow-covered slopes of the Norwegian Fjord and the more McCormick lines. Beautiful ship. Throughout the busy war years, when they were operating more than 150 ships for the government, more McCormick lines gave constant thought to the development of the finer, faster ships that would be required to meet the needs of peace. Big, swift, and efficient, the seven new cargo liners, which have now joined their fleet, are the result of that planning.
see another really nice illustration. When these ships were projected, Moore McCormick in a review of their long experience listed the inadequacies of the scores of ships they have owned, operated and charted throughout the years. Then they proceeded with their design, the elimination from it, everything they knew to be inefficient or outmodeled into it when all that would meant be faster, more efficient, and newer ships. Now in a dozen ways to results of their planning is evident. You see another little illustration. The value of these features to shippers is obvious. With larger hatches and improved rigging, the ship can load and discharge with a maximum of speed. The shipments move to market with dispatch. Because of the sea speed shown by these ships and their efficiency in port, the operators have reduced turnaround the ships and furnish more efficient, more satisfactory service. With more commodious uh, tanks and larger refrigerated space, opportunities for special cargoes are improved at a time when they need them most in the industry. And I think this is the ship that's on the cover. Yep. Beautiful. I love that picture. This is the open sea. The green, white, and black stacks of the Santa Rosa stand out against the Caribbean sunset. And that is the Grace Line. You can see the flag for the Grace Line and the smokestacks with the green and the black. Monday, January 27, 1947, was a milepost of the post-war activities of the U.S. Merchant Marine. On that day, the Santa Rosa arrived in New York in a civilian garb for the first time since Pearl Harbor. She was the first American flag cruise liner to resume service from New York to her, from her return, marked the first step in the um, inauguration of Grace Liner's express passenger cargo service to the Caribbean. Three months later, her sister ships, the Santa Paula, made her post-war bow, bow to New York Harbor. On May 7th, these two famous ships began weekly sailings for both pleasure and essential travel to Venezuela, the Dutch West Indies, and Colombia. With the return of the Santa Paula, the Grace Line could probably proudly say that it was the first American flag passenger liner to go back into full-scale service after the war. Both the Santa Paula and the Santa Rosa had distinguished war records, more fortunate than their sisters. The Santa Lucia uh, rechristened the USS Leedstown and assigned to naval duty, which went down in the invasion of Casablanca, and the Santa Alina, which was sunk by enemy action off Philippineville, Algeria in 1943. Neither the Santa Rosa nor the Santa Paula was damaged during the war. You can see another illustration. The demand for American goods in these companies parallels the permanent U.S. demands on the U.S. in addition to luxury items. Venezuela particularly depends on us for many staples such as flour, potatoes, canned milk, canned fruits and vegetables carried under refrigeration. A great deal of construction is also being undertaken. There is a connection with port railroad and communication facilities as well as extensive oil drilling. The flow of passengers bound on business and diplomatic missions in both directions have been heavy enough to warrant reserving 50% of America of passenger space for their use. Thus, the Grace Line, as soon as possible, reinstituted on a larger scale one of its traditional routes between the Americas for the benefit of the shipper and the traveler alike. And look at this pretty lady. I love the blue. Likes Brothers Steamship Company. The James Likes, outward bound and heavily loaded, clears the jetty at Arnsaw Pass in Texas. And this is the Lines Brothers Steamship Company. Look at that. I love the blue. Today, with a company-owned fleet of 50 fast, modern sea-type cargo vessels with scores of others required to maintain emergency service on its trade routes, under charter from the United States Maritime Commission, Likes Brothers Steamship Company Incorporated maintains its position one after World War I. 
as owner and operator of the largest fleet of American flag freighters engaged in foreign trade. You can see another illustration. Components of the new Likes fleet include 10 C-1 type vessels, 33 C-2 type, and 7 C-3 type, all equipped with the newest in cargo handling gear, cargo protection devices, and advanced navigating and engineering equipment. The C-1 type vessels average 450 feet, uh, 415 feet in length, excuse me, and have a beam of 60 feet, and have a cruising speed of 14 and a half knots. Displacement is over 12,000 tons. Deadweight tonnage is 9,000 tons and a bale cubic carbo cargo capacity is 455,000 cubic feet. The like C2 vessels, largest group of the C class and the company owned fleet are 460 feet long and have a beam of 63 feet and a cruising speed of 15 and a half knots. They displace 14,900 tons dead weight 10,560 tons, and they have a capacity of 542,000 feet. Queens of the Likes fleet are seven C3 type vessels averaging 490 feet in length with a beam of 69 and a half feet, and they displace 18,330 tons. 12,587 tons dead weight and a bale cubic capacity of 691,000 ton uh, feet and they have a cruising speed of 16 and a half knots you can see the the other illustration that's there and let's see look at this lovely lady this is bull lines ss angelina with a cargo of sugar aboard press um, a, she's got a cargo of sugar aboard, passes under the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is the A.H. Bull Steamship Company. You can see their flag. The firm of Miller, Bull, and Knowlton, established in 1886, became in 1902 a firm of A.H. Bull and Company shipping agents and operators it was incorporated in 1924 and continues a general agency business the ship owning company the a h bull steamship company was incorporated in 1902. the first vessel of the bull line fleet was purchased in 1897 and at the time of the declaration of the first world war the fleet consisted of 15 vessels all under the american flag and all but two were constructed in american yards during both world wars, the fleet was employed in full service. And it goes on to say, that during the war, the A.H. Bull Company, the operating branch, acted as an agent for the War Shipping Administration and maintained not only as Puerto Rico and Santa Domingo services, but also the operation throughout the world of vessels which carried vital supplies and materials to the Pacific and Atlantic battle areas. At one time, this company was operating more than 90 vessels for the War Shipping Administration. And what it does now, it goes on to the contents. I know it's hard to believe it. we went through all these all these ships. I wanted to show them all to you and give you a little bit of the background on the shipping companies. Um, I think we did that. It's got the acknowledgements, the uh, acknowledgements on the bottom. And I think that might be it. Yeah, that's it. So all in all, this book is, I don't say charming very often, but it's, it's so packed full of history. And this is like a window into 1947. Um, think about it. The war had just ended. Everything was, every country was war weary. And they're trying to go back from um, being, you know, taken over by the government to actually try to go back to their own, um, their businesses and their own civilian lives. But... Make no mistake, this is a very important part of American history, the Merchant Marine, 
and this book was just really really nice if you get a chance to get it um, I suggest you pick it up lovers of history you're just gonna love this book I pretty much went over everything but it goes into a little more detail on all of the uh, the shipping companies and yeah that, that's about it so my friends um, I didn't want this video to last six days, <laughs> but I did want to tell you all the important parts of all the, the little nuggets that I had made notes of to share with you. So my friends, that is Ships of the Merchant Marines by S. Kip Farrington Jr., illustrations by Jack Coggins. And we heard from Chester W. Nimitz, the Admiral of the Fleet. And I thank you so much for watching. And until my next historic book, I'll talk to you soon.